Hello, YouTube. Be sure and hit that like and subscribe button, and notification bell, so that when we have a new video that comes out, you'll be the first to get a hold of it. Now, we live in a time when the supreme virtue is tolerance. Rather than society being interpreted from the perspective of the Bible, rather than getting our understanding of who we are from God, today people are getting the understanding of who God is from society, from Hollywood, from the left, from the Democrats, from the gay rights activists, from the preachers, from the radio preaching, uh, TV preaching, people are getting their image of who God is. And God is being rethought, reinterpreted by the Bible colleges and the universities. In logic, there's what's called poisoning the well. And that's when someone's going to come to the well and drink, and you don't want them drinking there. So what you do is you poison that well and let them know that if they drink there, they'll be poisoned, and that keeps them away from it. So that's what's happening today. They tell us that if you're intolerant, then you're not a Christian. If you're not loving, then you're not right with God. If you have a view that you express or try to convert people, then you're, you're practicing hate speech. And so they poison the well, and, and Christians who believe the truth have gotten afraid to go there. They've gotten afraid to go and drink from that biblical well, from, from expressing biblical truth. We're told to say gay and not queer. We're told to be kind and generous in our words, and our terminology. Uh, preachers don't preach on hell anymore. They don't believe in it. They don't preach against sin as sin. Rather, the sermons that you hear are sermons of compassion and forgiveness and understanding and tolerance and patience. And it, it's gotten to where it's sick to God what Christians, even those who still hold the truth, the way they've been scared away from standing firmly on biblical truth. And I admit there, there are places that if you go and drink, you're going to be labeled. The same is occurring with our child training. I mean, people are embarrassed to admit they spank their kids anymore. They're embarrassed to admit that they hold high standards. The same has come true of abortion. 15, 20 years ago, the conservative right would have stood firmly against abortion. But today, just to get rid of killing them at the last minute, it seems to be a triumph and a victory. And uh, our leaders that we elect to office no longer take firm stands. Uh, today, uh, a president, or as recently has occurred, a general in the military can speak of God outside the military context in a church and be kicked out of his office uh, as a military. It's not, he's not supposed to do that. He's not supposed to have faith. He's not supposed to admit that there's something evil and there's something good in the universe. Now we're going to look at some passages in Psalms that talk about who God is. And it's going to be a shock to some of you because you're already so polluted since you get most of your information from Hollywood and magazines and movies and, and uh, books that you read and the people you come across rather than from the Word of God. It's going to be a shock to you. Turn to Psalm in the first part of it here. Psalm 3. Now this is who God is. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Now, I used to get in fights when I was a kid, almost weekly, sometimes more often. And I usually got whipped. I was a skinny weakling. And uh, I got whipped by girls. I got whipped by people smaller than me. Uh, I've been hit in the mouth a lot of times. I can still feel the jarring of my head and the stars and hear your teeth clack together. And it, it's a sound you never forget after it's happened to you about 70 times, you know. And it, it happened to me many times. I, I've seen those little stars floating around. And I've hit a lot of people. And 
at the moment it's a satisfying feeling to know you've laid one on and they hadn't hit you back. I remember I got in a fight one time in, uh, in Woodshop. I, got, I was fighting this fellow over the uh, lathe who was going to get to use it. And uh, we've tumbled over tables, we knocked stuff off, we fought every which way, and I jammed my thumb, cocked it back so hard, man caught it in the side of his ear or something, you know. And my thumb was swelling fast, and I just about couldn't use that hand. And uh, back in those days, things were different from now. So the shop teacher rushed in and put a stop to it and said, you can't fight here, let's go. Well, of course, we knew where we were going. You go out behind the gymnasium, all the guys come out, and you finish it. And they sit there and watch you bloody each other, and then you go back to school, and you go back. I mean, that's the way it was back then. So we start heading out to the gym, behind the uh, gymnasium to finish our fight, you know. And uh, I, I start talking to him, he started talking to me. Time we got there, we're best of friends. Uh, <laughs> now, I never did get a pleasure out of really hitting anybody unless it's right in the heat of battle, you know. It's an awful thing to hit somebody in the face and kind of feel their face cave in and around your fist. It, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a violent, uh, cruel, um, awful thing. And uh, since I've been grown, I've not had the occasion to do that. And I'm thankful I hadn't. hope I never do again. But I've heard people say this. I, I say, he knocked his teeth down his throat. Now that's kind of a figure of speech. And when somebody does that, that's extreme violence. Knocked his teeth out. Now I've never had any teeth knocked out, never knocked anybody's teeth out, but to hit someone hard enough to break their tooth, it smashes their lips, creates holes in their cheeks, and creates a lot of bleeding, and it's a pretty violent hit to knock somebody's teeth out. Now what did the Bible just say? Look at it again. Thou hast smitten all thine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. God cherishes the opportunity to break the teeth of ungodly people. God would hit somebody in the mouth, cave in their cheeks, and break their teeth out when they're ungodly. That's who God is. You say, well, I'm just not comfortable with that. It shows how deluded you've become. Keep reading in Psalm 5. He says, verse 5, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. A couple times in my life I've preached a sermon on God hates sinners. Now, <laughs> that's not a very popular title or message for a sermon. God loves sinners. That goes over great. When I go to the prisons, there's guys who come into the chapel there, and uh, there will be six or eight of them sometime, and they'll sit in the back. They're queers. And they look for an opportunity to get into the bathroom <coughs> together. There have been rapes occurred with far here to that back door from where I stand and preach, not to my knowledge while I was there, but in that chapel, in that bathroom. And when you talk to these guys, they will tell you, that God is loving and forgiving and that God forgives sinners and they resent you telling them that God hates the workers of iniquity. They will tell you, no, God does not hate anybody. And they really get angry if you tell them that. I've heard many a sermon in that chapel coming there to rendezvous. They've heard many a sermon over the last 15 or 20 years that they've been in and out of prison two or three times. And they know that God loves everybody. They know that God is a loving God and they are ready to preach it back to you when you charge them with sin or warn them of damnation in hell. That is the perspective they have gotten on who God is from preachers. They've gotten the perspective that God loves sinners regardless. You know, until a sinner repents, he is under God's hatred. You say, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, God loved. He loved the elect. God loved those whom he saw would be saved. God loved the end product of what he produced. But God does not love a man when that man is in a state of sin. God does not love you. He does not have these ooshy feelings for you when you're walking in sin. God hates you. 
when you're in sin. When a man turns on his computer and gets on the web and begins to look at pornography, God hates him. God stands there like this, rubbing his knuckles into his palm, saying, I am going to hit him right in the kisser, and I'm going to break his teeth out. God is standing there thinking about giving him a knee in the groin and ending this thing right now. God is thinking about grabbing that hand that's on the keyboard and twisting it around behind him and lifting it up until the bones snap. That is God's attitude towards a man on the web doing pornography. Right. You're going to see some more of the scripture here. He says, the foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. God abhors the man who's bloody, the man who goes out seeking violence, the man who goes out to destroy others, the man who's deceitful, the man who hides his sin, God abhors him. The man who, who sins during the week with alcohol or booze or cigarettes or dirty television or dirty movie or dirty book or through his lustful eyes and then comes home to his wife and pretends to be a righteous man, God abhors him. When a man comes to church or a preacher comes and stands in the pulpit and he has been sinning during the week, but he pretends it's all right and he goes on and preaches righteousness and holiness as if he had been practicing it without repenting God abhors that man. He despises him. When a young person comes to church having been smooching and making out during the week, having been placing their hands on the opposite sex and exploring, having been experiencing the joys of sex outside marriage, God hates and despises that little teenage girl. God abhors that individual as if she were a bloody murderer because she's deceitful. She's a liar. She's a fraud. She's a fake. She's not walking in purity and holiness. When I meet someone on the street or in the prison or wherever, and they tell me that they're saved, and uh, it's obvious that they're not walking in truth, I meet them boldly with a question. I say to them, I won't tell you necessarily what I would say to them, but I would ask them a question that deals into their personal life that deals in their last two or three days that ask them, have you committed this sin? I, I ask them very frankly about their holiness, about their walk of purity. And if they're not walking in holiness, I just tell them, then you're not a Christian. Christians don't do that. That cuts through all that ice. That gets around all the doctrine. That gets down to the nitty gritty. God abhors that person. Now in Psalm 7, verse 9, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. But establish the just, for the righteous God trieth the hearts and the reins. Verse 11, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked Every day, if he turn not, he will wet his sword. That means sharpen it. I sat down at the table just yesterday, and I took out my knife that I keep in a sheath that's almost razor sharp. And Gabriel brought a deer in and laid the carcass on the table, and I wet my knife. I run it slowly and lovingly across the stone. And I can feel the edge as it begins to sharpen. And then I take out a ceramic or diamond and I work the edge a little bit more and I'm getting it sharp. So with hardly any pressure at all, I can ply it and it can go down through the flesh, cut the tendon, slide between the joints and the bone and separate the knee of the deer from the ham. I wet my blade getting it ready. The Bible says here that the wickedness of the wicked shall come to an end. God has wet his sword. He's preparing the instruments of death for the sinner. God is preparing to slay you, to make you his sacrifice, to plunge his blade into you and cut you away from your life of sin. 
He says, God is angry with the wicked every day. That means when God gets up in the morning, he gets up in a bad mood toward the wicked. When God gets up in the morning, he's angry at the sinner. When God goes throughout the day, he's constantly agitated at those who don't obey the law of God. God is constantly irritated, agitated, and angry, and he smolders toward those who are living in sin. See, God loves righteousness, and he loves his son, and he loves the sinner to the degree that that sinner repents. And not until that sinner repents does God turn in grace and mercy. Now, in his great infinite love and anticipation of what would be, God prepared a way for sinners before they ever turned. God prepared a place of meeting, a, a place of atonement and forgiveness, and made full propitiation before the sinner ever repented. But God still gets up angry every morning at the sinner. And he says... Verse 13, he hath prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. He's prepared the instruments of death. Psalm 9, verse 7, but the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. God has prepared the instruments of death. He's got his attitude prepared for judgment. He's angry. He hates all workers of iniquity, and now he prepares his throne for judgment. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in righteousness. And he says, verse 10, they that know thy name shall put their trust in thee. Verse 15, the heathen are sunk down into the pit that they made. Verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. I don't like to preach on hell. I've just n never done it but a couple times in my life because I just don't like it. It's miserable. I, if I were writing the Bible, there would be no hell in it. If I were making up my Bible doctrine, I would not make hell a part of it. When I was 20 years old, I decided that I didn't want to believe in hell. I was preaching regularly on the street. I'd led many people to the Lord, but I decided I didn't want to believe in the doctrine of hell. It was too embarrassing to present it. And so I got my Bible out and I spent about six months where I did not preach on hell and did not mention it because I was trying to come up with sufficient scripture that I could dismiss the doctrine. I read Jehovah's Witness literature to see if they had any evidence against the doctrine of hell since they didn't believe in it. I studied my Bible from front to back. I looked it up and I looked for any way I could allegorize, figureize, or get dismissed the concept of eternal burning hell. I sincerely wanted to get rid of it. And you know me well enough to know that if I could find it, I'd stand on that ground because I'm not held by the convention of men or anybody else's Bible doctrine. And after about six months, I had to face the fact that if there is a God, if the Bible is his word, and if there's a heaven, then there's an eternal burning hell. Yeah. And that's the reason I believe it today. Not because I'm a right-wing fundamentalist and it suits my personality. I believe it because the Bible teaches it and I have no other choice. Yeah. And so I tell you today, there is a hell. There is a place where sinners will suffer forever and forever. There is a place where the sinners will be turned in God's wrath and God's anger. So I just don't see how a loving God could send sinners to hell. It won't be a loving God that sends sinners to hell. It'll be an angry God. Amen. It'll be a God of righteousness who hates the workers of iniquity. So I just, I just wouldn't be happy with that. God is going to damn the sinner and he is going to mock them as they fall into hell. Yeah. He's going to celebrate their damnation with ridicule. I mean, he's going to make the Taliban look like Bill Gothard seminar graduates. <laughs> His anger and hatred and hostility towards sinners is going to be an embarrassment for Christians. It's going to be beyond anything anybody on this earth has ever felt towards evil except maybe a mother who's had her baby raped. Says in 10... 
The wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord hateth. The wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord hateth. You see, God hates covetous people. God hates people who covet a house, a car, clothes, somebody's wife, somebody's job, somebody's position. God hates a covetous person. We're not talking about dope heads now. We're talking about people coveting something that someone else has got or that they don't have and they won't, and they covet it. It becomes a burning, consuming desire to have, to possess, and God hates the covetous person. And he said, the wicked boast of his heart's desire. In other words, he brags about, you go down where a bunch of men are on the job and you listen to them brag about their heart's desire. Woman will walk by and they'll all brag about what they want to do to her. I mean, it's just, you can, you can count on it like you can count on the sun coming up every day. You get four or five men together on the job, a bunch of sinners. Any woman that walks by, she can be fat and ugly and one of them's going to make some comment about what he'd like to do. That's the way godless men are. And you let the rich person come around the job and they'll start talking about how they'd like to have their riches or their wealth or how what a pity it is. And God hates covetous people. He says, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Now that's a good one to use, Tremaine. Somebody says he's a Christian, ask him, is God in all your thoughts? Is God in your thoughts of sex? Is God in your thoughts of money? Is God in the thoughts of your job? Because the wicked person is identified by the fact that God is not in all his thoughts. That doesn't mean you're thinking about God every second of the day, but that means there is no thought. There is no place where your mind goes to dwell that God is not part of that equation. There is no idea, no concept, no motivation that, that occurs, but that God is part of that equation. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above all, out of his sight. I've been talking to sinners and they said to me, I just don't understand that. I don't understand the Bible. I've read this verse to them. And I've said, the Bible says that the reason you don't understand it is your ways, you're, you're a sinner. And sinners don't understand as for his enemies, he puffeth at them. He said, oh, I don't believe that. It won't happen to me. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud is under his tongue. Mischief and vanity. Cursing is part of the mouth of the sinner. Deceit, mischief is part of the mouth of the sinner. He sitteth in the lurking places in the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privately against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He croucheth, he humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hideth his face. He'll never see it. Verse 11. He hath said in his heart, let apart, thou shalt not require it. In other words, God's not going, there's not going to be a day when God requires this at my hand. There's not going to be a day when God holds me accountable. Verse 15. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. The psalmist prays, break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Now, can you imagine someone in one of these large national get togethers of Christians and homeschoolers and what all standing up to pray the introductory prayer. And he says, Lord, today we want to call to your mind, all the covetous all the liars, all the bloody and deceitful people, all the abortion providers, all those women who have elected to have an abortion, all those sodomites out in California and Nashville. And God, we just ask you this morning to break their arm, to dash out their teeth, to hate them with a pure and perfect hatred as we hate them with a pure and perfect hatred. That's biblical praying. But you won't ever hear it. Why? Because it'd be an embarrassment. I'd be embarrassed. I mean, everybody would be embarrassed because you know it's going to be on the front page the next day. You know that it's going to cause Christians to be persecuted. And so we try to keep those things from being too public. But what about in small assemblies where just Christians are present? You see, you see how far deluded we've become? You see how far removed from the truth we've become? How propagandized we've been made and he goes on he says 
Psalm 11, verse 6. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. 12.3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips. Sounds to me like torture here. The, the flattering lips who flatter in order to gain some advantage over someone. Uh, that's the salesman's mouth, you know, who just flatters to gain someone's favor. It says that God's going to take that sword that he sharpened, reach around and grab them by the top and their bottom lip, jerk it out, and saw it off right at their teeth. Going to cut their lips off. Uh, this is Bible, right? I didn't make this up. He'll cut off the lips of the flatterer. And then someone turns around and says, God, look at that horrible. Look what somebody did to that man. He's, he's got no lips. It's just his teeth, bloody teeth are sticking out. And God said, I did that. He flattered yesterday. Man. Then he says, upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. And six, the words of the Lord are pure words. The words of the Lord are pure words. Now what we've been reading. Tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. In other words, all you've been reading are the pure words of God. Tried in a furnace of fire. In other words, before God put these out, He purified these words. When I write something, uh, I write it and then I look at it and I say, no, that's, that's not quite right and I take it out. And then I rewrite it, and my wife looks at it, and she says, no, you got a bad attitude there, and so I take that out. And then I send it over to somebody else to prove it, and they prove it and say, no, I said, this is not right, and I change it again. And finally, I get the thing ready for publication. It's already been through the judgment seat of Christ about 30 times. It's been purified, something I couldn't just sit down and write and come out pure. When I give a tape, I go home and cut a lot of stuff out of it. You know, this carnal fleshly stuff when I speak something. Sometimes I just throw my tapes away. They're no good. And so, and I wonder how much, you know, even after I publish something, how much of it's pure. But so the Bible says that God's words have been purified seven times. They've been sifted. They've been checked for error. They've been checked for attitude. They've been checked, purified, and prepared and given to us. And here we have them today. And what you just read is God's words purified seven times. And there's no slip up on it. It's not the words of man failing to express the heart of God. This is the heart of God. Now, the first thing the Bible says about a sinner to define it. You know what the first thing is? It says there's no fear of God before his eyes. No fear of God before his eyes. I'm scared of God. You say, oh, you ought not be. Well, I am. And I ought to be. The Bible says the beginning of wisdom. And I'm, a, I'm afraid of God. You say, why are you afraid of him? Because he's made me sick a couple times, nearly killed me. Because he'll chasten me if I get in sin. Because he is the one who holds the keys of death and hell. And I'm afraid of God. If you're not, then you don't really know it. You don't know the God I know if you're not afraid of him. If you can live in sin for days and pretend that it's all right, then you don't know the God I know. If you can walk with hidden sin and slip around and do your pornography or do your lust or do your girls or guys or, or whatever it is you do or, or uh, covet what someone else has got, and you can go on without God in your thoughts and still think you know God, then you don't know the God I know because he ought to scare you to death. You think about getting your lips cut off, your teeth broken out, your arm bent behind you, and God getting up mad at you and you're not scared of him. And this is just the first 12 Psalms. We could go through the whole Psalm and you'd be absolutely shocked and astounded at all the Bible's got to say about the wicked. And then if we got into the book of Proverbs and then we went through Isaiah and Ezekiel at what God promises to do. And then we came to the New Testament and went through Matthew 25 and then through the book of Revelation, book of James, book of 1 John. You'd be totally depressed. 
You'd say, please give me a sermon on justification by faith, and I'd be ready for one too. <laughs> I'm thankful that God loved Christ and is giving him the heathen for his inheritance. You see, you've got to get in Christ to get into God's love. You understand that? You've got to get into Christ to get into God's love. You've got to be executed for God to accept you. You've got to be killed. God just doesn't love the man in his sin. God's got this broken, weepy heart, and he just keeps being over compassionate and, and extending more and more grace like some father who is walking in guilt for his irresponsibility raising his son and keeps bailing him out of jail. That's not the kind of God we've got. And you have got to repent and get under the blood of Jesus Christ, be crucified, buried, and raised again before you can abide in the love of God. And only then are you accepted in the beloved. You're not accepted in your sinful state. You're accepted in a crucified, buried, and resurrected state. And that's the only state you're accepted in. The first thing John the Baptist preached was repent. The first thing Jesus preached, the first words out of his mouth was repent. First word, repent. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He was not suggesting there's anyone righteous. He was suggesting that that crowd of hypocrites listening to him, if they wanted to get to be part of his message, they were going to have to repent because that's where you start with God. You start as a sinner repenting. And if you're not willing to start there, then you're not part of his call. So you need to repent. You need to repent to get out from under the wrath of God. And I hope some of you young fellows who eventually go out to preach, that you preach the truth the way it used to be preached 100 years ago. Instead of the way the TV and radio evangelists and the seminar principal teachers put it out today. All the books on forgiveness and compassion and sensitivity. Throw all that stuff away and go back and get your book and bury yourself in the book of Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel. Until you preach like one of the prophets. Then you'll move sinners to repentance. Father, we thank you today for your word. And God, we don't understand, even as we've spoken of these things, the awfulness and horror that the sinner will face in the day of judgment. I thank you, Lord, for the blood. If it were not for the blood, we'd all be under your hatred and wrath right this moment. God, thank you for the cleansing power. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit that's moved us to repentance. And God, I pray those that heard this message... They're walking in sin. I pray, Father, you'll cause them to repent right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.